Thank you for joining me today. Welcome to The Teaching Lady. I'm so glad that you stopped by. Today we are making our way through lesson number two on 30 Days to Understanding the Bible by Max Anders. If you have not read this book before, I would encourage you to do so. You can get it off of Amazon or at your local Christian bookstore. Last time we were together, we looked at an overview of the Bible, how many books there are, the how many authors, uh, the type of book they are, the time frame that the Bible covers. So if you've not had a chance to check out study number one, please do so. And before I forget, if you like this channel, please hit subscribe, hit the bell notification so that you will be notified of upcoming video sessions on this study. Well, before we get started, we're going to go ahead and open up in prayer. If you would join me, please, I'd appreciate it. Father, I just thank you for this study. I thank you, Lord, for your word. I thank you that it is living and active, that it's sharper than any two-edged sword. And Father, today, as we look at the land where this took place, Lord, I pray that we come with an open heart and open mind and open ears to hear from you. And it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. All right, so we are on chapter two, and today we're going to look at land, a lot of land. We're going to specifically look at Old Testament lands. So these would be places and bodies of water that were spoken about and written about in Old Testament times. And some of those you are going to recognize as being current places today. Now, as you can see, I have our map set up here. We have bodies of water and we have uh, places for me to outline the specific countries or towns or cities that are mentioned, the main ones mentioned in the Old Testament. That's what we're looking at today, Old Testament lands. We will look at the New Testament lands further down the road, but for today we're going to concentrate on the Old Testament. Now, why would we do that? Well, first of all, having a knowledge of the geography is going to give us perspective about the events of the Bible. It's helpful to know the names, the locations, and the relative positions of important places. Otherwise, we skim over the information and we get very little comprehension or visual, visualization. That's a hard word to say, right? And when we don't have that, I think it makes the Bible less interesting. I think knowing that this land here, that the people walked it, gives me a whole new appreciation for when I read the story about it. So it's one of the things we're going to look at. The one who ignores the geography, well, you're in a sense ignoring the history part of it. The Bible is largely history. So to begin our mastery of the history, we got to understand the geography. Now, the first thing we're going to start off with is bodies of water. And we have a big body of water, our first body of water. And forgive me, my drawing skills are about as good as a second grader. They could probably draw better than me. But I've kind of given an outline of the bodies of water. Has He has mapped them out in this book to the best of my ability. So if things aren't exactly to longitude and latitude, well, give me a little grace. I appreciate it. But our big body of water here, okay, number one. Do we have an idea, anybody have an idea of what that is? All right. Well, we know that as the Mediterranean Sea. All right, so our description for the Mediterranean Sea, the author says, the land of the Old Testament lies east of this beautiful blue body of water. All right, so moving on to number two, we have 
two, three, and four, all of this body of water that kind of looks like, the author describes it, it looks like a bite out of a hot dog bun. But number two would be the Sea of Galilee. Now, we hear the word sea, we read it in scripture, and when, the first time I, I read that, honestly, I was thinking ocean. I don't know why, because I guess I had never looked at a world map and looked at this closely. I just assumed that meant a huge body of water, that it was an ocean, because I always uh, assimilate or associate, I should say, that's the probably the better word, uh, sea with ocean. And in this case, it's a lake. It's not what we know as a sea. And this Sea of Galilee happens to be seven miles wide by about 14 miles long. And it runs into the Jordan River, which is number three. Now the Jordan River travels about 65 miles as the crow flies and it empties into what we know as, or maybe you've heard, the Dead Sea. Now you might be familiar with these names if you've read scripture, you've read where Jesus uh, traveled across the Sea of Galilee You've read where he was baptized in the Jordan River, and we've read passages on the Dead Sea from the Old Testament. What's interesting to me also about the Dead Sea is I've known people that have gone to Israel and they have swam in the Dead Sea as recently as three, four years ago. This was back in Old Testament days, these bodies of water back in Old Testament days. The Jordan River, Joshua and the people crossed over to go into the Promised Land. The Dead Sea today, it's not so much swimming in it because everything comes down and it just kind of dumps into the Dead Sea and then there's no place for it to go. It's the southernmost part and they say, the description here, says that it's almost 3,000 feet below sea level at its lowest point. So all the water flows down into it and then there's no place for it to go. So friends of mine that went there and they swam in it, they said it was more like floating. They weren't really swimming as much as they were floating in this water that was so thick that it was kind of, they said swimming was uncomfortable and it just felt too difficult to swim. Floating, you just kind of floated and you really didn't need to put much effort into it because the water was so thick in the Dead Sea. It's very interesting. It has a high concentration of mineral deposits and it doesn't support normal animal and plant life, hence the name the Dead Sea. Well, number five, we're gonna shift over to this side of our map, we have Coming out of the Mediterranean, this river right here kind of breaks off into the Mediterranean Sea, and this is the Nile River. You've probably heard the Nile River, very famous river in Egypt. And the Nile River, perhaps the most famous river in the world, flows through the heart of Egypt, spreads out like several fingers, and it empties into the Mediterranean Sea. Number six and seven, you have these twin rivers for almost a thousand miles each. Okay, so we have the Tigris and the Euphrates. And these two rivers, okay, flow for almost a thousand miles. A thousand miles is a long way. If I was to fly from my house up north in the United States, I'd be flying almost a thousand miles. These two rivers, the author estimates that these two rivers are almost a thousand miles long. Okay, the Tigris and Euphrates. 
uh, and they flow, they join together and they flow into our last body of water, which is the Persian Gulf. Right here, okay? These last three bodies of water, the Tigris, the Euphrates, the Persian Gulf, okay, form the easternmost boundary for the lands of the Old Testament. The Tigris and Euphrates flow through, and get this, present day Iraq, while the Persian Gulf separates Iran from Saudi Arabia. Do any of those names sound familiar? I bet they do, right? The Tigris and Euphrates throwing, flowing through present day Iraq. So here we go, flowing through, and Persian Gulf probably sounds familiar to you too, uh, especially if you live in the States, where our troops at one point years ago fought the Persian Gulf War. They were over in this area, okay? Very interesting stuff. All right, so now we have the bodies of water established that were mentioned in the Old Testament. Now let's look at locations. Some famous locations, all right? So with the geographical framework offered by the bodies of water, now we can establish the locations that are relevant to the Old Testament. Number one, or the letter A, as we'll call it, the Garden of Eden. Where on our map would you suppose that it's estimated, okay, where the Garden of Eden would be? Now, this is strictly an educated guess by biblical commentators as to where the Garden of Eden would be based on the description in the Bible about some rivers, okay? We have um, in Genesis 2, now let's just turn to that for a moment. Genesis 2, I have a reference here written down, Genesis 2, and this is not, this particular passage is not in the book. I went researching it for myself to see if I could find anything. All right, here we go. Genesis 2, chapter 10, or I'm sorry, chapter 2, verse 10. It says, a river watering the garden flowed from Eden. From there, it's separated into four headwaters. The name of the first is Pishon. It winds through the entire land of Havilah, where there is gold. The gold of that land is good. Aromatic resin and onyx are also there. The name of the second river is the Gihon. It winds through the entire land of Cush. The name of the third river is the Tigris. It runs along the east side of Asher. And the fourth river is the Euphrates. So biblical commentators have noted that while they can't locate the first two rivers, okay, which were Pishon and Gehan, they have been able to locate, locate the Tigris and the Euphrates. So they're estimating, based on that, that these flows all come together, that the Garden of Eden would be somewhere around here. Okay? Somewhere around this place is the Garden of Eden, because the four rivers coming together. Now what happened to the first two rivers? I don't know. And they don't know. But their best guess for the location of the Garden of Eden, where everything began, would be somewhere around here, which I just find that so fascinating in and of itself, based on the lands that are here today, Iraq and Iran. It's just, it just blows my mind. The letter B, let's look at the letter B. Canaan, the promised land. Remember Moses, when the Israelites came out of Egypt, he was taking them to the promised land. Now, it took them a long time to get there, but they finally get there. And the estimated place for Canaan would be somewhere, okay, for our letter B, be somewhere in here for Canaan. You, they have to cross the Jordan River, if we 
read the story of Joshua because, you know, Moses doesn't get to go into the promised land because he tapped the rock without giving glory to God. So Joshua leads the Israelites into the promised land, but he has to cross the Jordan River first. So he's going to be crossing from this side over. So somewhere over in here is Canaan or the promised land that we read about in Exodus, Deuteronomy, those books there, Leviticus. Number C or letter C, Jerusalem. Now you all know from current events that Jerusalem is a hot topic. Okay, uh, prior pres that was in office moved the, um, and I can never, the embassy, I can never think of that word, the embassy to Jerusalem uh, acknowledged that it was the capital of Israel. Okay, somewhere in here. Now forgive me for my drawing because I don't have the exact coordinates, so I'm giving you an estimated area. You can go and check out the world map for yourself because Jerusalem is still on the map, right? And so is Israel, Canaan, Israel. Somewhere around here is Jerusalem, and that's like the center of everything that is happening in the Bible. That's central to the story. And it has to be singled out and identified, okay? It's now the capital of Israel, as we know. The next letter, D, Egypt. And we talked about how the Nile River runs through the center of Egypt. We also talked about the fact that Moses went and got the Israelite people, and they traveled out of there, Okay, God released them, led them, they crossed uh, the Red Sea. We think of Red Sea, this is the Red Sea. They crossed over to this to go into this land here to get away from Pharaoh and the Egyptians, okay? So they left Egypt, escaped the slavery, all right? With Moses, Egypt over here, as we talked about the Nile going through the center of Egypt. So we know that it's over here and we know that the people went this way, okay, based on description in the Bible, and that they would go south, and then they would come back up. And we may look at that later on to get a better idea of where they spent all their time in the desert. Because remember, they ended up spending 40 years in the desert. Next up, we have Assyria, the letter E. They estimate that Assyria was somewhere up in here. Now Assyria ends up going off the map at some point in time because the Assyrians came down and they invaded the northern kingdom of Israel because at that time, when you had Israel here, okay, Israel ended up splitting. There were 12 tribes of Israel and they each got land, okay? And at some point in time, those 12 tribes split into 10 northern tribes and two southern tribes. And Assyria came in and they took over the northern tribes of Israel. Well, what happens is that eventually the Babylonians come on the scene, led by King Nebuchadnezzar. He comes in and he takes over the Assyrians and the Israelites and the southern kingdom. And he exiles them all back to his place. Okay, and we're going to look at his place. So Assyria over here, so the Assyrians end up being exiled. All right. All righty. Now, Babylonia, letter F, which we, I just kind of mentioned. Over here somewhere. Babylonia, Babylon, modern day Iraq. It's just... When I think of this stuff, I go, why did I not know this before? Well, I never looked at the map before. Okay, so modern day Iraq. This is another gigantic historical world power. Although it was short-lived, okay, nation conquered Assyria. It also conquered the southern kingdom of Judah, which I mentioned, okay, Israel, the two tribes that came in 
It conquered all the territory that Assyria had taken over by the northern kingdom. Okay, they took the, over the northern kingdom. They come in and took the southern kingdom. All right. Now here's here's the thing. The Babylonians are over here. They come and they take over the northern territory and the southern territory over here. That's a long way. A long way on foot. Because you got to remember that these lands, these people, are not traveling by plane, train, and automobile. They're walking most everywhere. They may have had camels, but how fast is a camel going to go? You're not going to get, I don't think everybody's going to go, whoo, whoo, and our camels are going to go, you know, haul and booty across the desert lands. And you're talking about hundreds of miles between the two. So when they come over and they exile the people from here and they take them back, that's a long walk for all those people. A long walk that would take weeks, maybe even a couple of months. We don't know. Try walking from your house a thousand miles northward, just walking every day with thousands of people with in your caravan. That's a lot. It's a lot. Now, Babylonia is found in Mesopotamia between the Tigris and the Euphrates. Mesopotamia means in the middle of the rivers, so it's in the middle of the rivers. And then lastly, we get to Persia. Persia, the final historical superpower of the Old Testament, is located at the northern bank of the Persian Gulf. So somewhere in here, okay? Persia comes into play by conquering Babylonia and by allowing the Hebrews to return from captivity to rebuild the city of Jerusalem and reinstate temple worship. That is so fascinating to me considering what Persia, who is now modern day Iran, thinks about that whole thing. I mean, think about that, okay? King Cyrus came in, took over okay, eliminated Nebuchadnezzar and all his people and tells them, the Jews, you can go back home. You can go back to Jerusalem. Now, some people didn't do that because either one, they liked where they were living now. They got used to Babylonian captivity and the ways of life there. Or two, hey, I'm too old to be walking from here to here. I'm not going to make it. I'm too tired. That was a long journey. We don't know exactly, but I'm just thinking common sense would say that is a long way. Now you did have some people that did return to Jerusalem to rebuild it. They rebuilt the wall. They rebuilt the temple. Okay, so you did have that happen, but that's a long way. I went ahead and I looked up some distances in miles, just looking and, and looking on um, maps and asking what's the distance between this city and this city to get an idea of how much space we're talking about. Because I think when I used to read the, the stories initially, I would think to myself, well, we're only probably talking a couple of miles. I mean, how big can it be? And then I was shocked when I looked it up and I'm like, 600 and some miles they walked? Are you kidding me? I can't even walk three miles down the road. And I'm like, oh, you know, winded, ready for a drink of water. But these people, in some cases, walked a long way. You think about the story of Abraham. Ur is somewhere over here. And God calls him to the land of Canaan. He's got to walk. He walks, and he doesn't walk this way across the desert, but he walks up this way and comes back down. He walked with all of his possessions, with his cattle, with everything that he had, with his family. They walked. And then he ends up going into Egypt and then coming back out. It's like when they moved around, they walked everywhere. We take that for granted and we think, oh, well, I could just get in my car and drive. I just get in my car and drive north 500 miles and I'll be there by this afternoon. Not the case with them. They walked everywhere. 
So when we know that and we think about that as we're reading the biblical narratives, knowing that helps us to appreciate more what the people went through. Think about in Jesus' time, he walked everywhere. He didn't fly. He didn't take a train or a bike or anything else. He walked this whole region. From here to here is like 75 miles. He walked that. I mean, we talked about the Jordan being 65 miles. Jesus walked this area. That's what our Savior did. He walked it. Now, if we look at the map, think about, and one of the, one of the um, things that the writer does, Max, is he says, compare this to the size of Texas. The state of Texas could sit over this whole thing. That would give you an idea of how much land mass we're talking about. And we all know, if you've looked at the state of Texas, it's big and it's wide right? It's a wide area. Thinking about the state of Texas. Now, looking at modern day, what we have for modern day land, which some of you will recognize. Egypt still exists today. We hear about it in the news. It's been in the news a lot. And you go, it has? <laughs> well, Maybe not in all the news that you're watching because there's not a whole lot of current news right now that is showing anything happening overseas. You need to go overseas and look at the news of what is happening in these areas because it's very interesting because a lot is happening that's not being shown in the States. This whole map is active right now with things moving and shifting all around things that as somebody who reads the Bible we need to be paying attention to because as we talked in our last session prophecy makes up at least 27 percent of the Bible and you need to be paying attention to prophecy in regards to current events today and watch things moving now you know I'm reminded that the Lord, to the Lord one day is a thousand years and a thousand years is like a day. Things are shifting. We don't know what's going to happen and when. But I do believe that we're another day closer to Christ's return. Based on looking at all the things that are happening, not only here, but overseas. You have to look at the big picture of what's happening overseas. So I'd encourage you to check that out. So... We have some lands using this map of some current places that you are going to be familiar with, and I'm going to fill those in now just to give you an idea. So you have Turkey up here, okay, north of the Mediterranean Sea. You have Lebanon which is in this area, okay? If you follow anything overseas, you know Lebanon is in the news a lot overseas, okay? You have Israel, which we know is in the news all the time. And if you look overseas, in the news overseas, you'll see Israel is in the news quite a bit. You have Egypt, which we talked about. You have the Jordan, okay? Not only the Jordan River, but the state Jordan or the country Jordan you have Syria over here somewhere we all know that a lot of stuff is happening in Syria uh, one of the places Damascus Syria okay that name may sound familiar to you uh, Paul in the New Testament he was on the Damascus Road okay on his way to probably persecute more Christians when he met Jesus on the Damascus Road Damascus, one of those places that is supposed to be, according to the Bible, will be wiped out. Uninhabitable. Well, where's all the action happening right now? In Syria? Okay. You have Iran over here. Taking up this area. You have Iraq. Over here. Right? In between. Okay. And on this side... You have Saudi Arabia. 
down here. Russia's up here somewhere, right? And then China and all these countries over here. And then this way, you have all of Greece, Italy, Rome, all of those countries out there, which those places we're going to look at when we look at the New Testament lands. Those places are going to come into place. So we see these modern names, and I could keep going with adding names that you're going to recognize. But some of these places, while they may not have, while they may not be called by their biblical name today, uh, Persia, Iran, Babylon, Iraq, okay, the Jordan, we know, Israel, we know, at one time it's called Canaan, the land of Canaan, uh, Egypt is still Egypt, right? Those places still exist today that were written in biblical times. 2,000 plus years ago, I would even say even further back than that, all right? Now, the entire land, I talked about the entire land of the Old Testament is approximately the same size of Texas. So if you're traveling from the Persian Gulf, right, so we're over here, the Persian Gulf, and you travel to Israel, okay, you are traveling about 875 miles, long way. If you are traveling from Israel to Egypt, you're talking about 275 miles is kind of the, the estimate that they have. Now, if you keep this in mind as the story of the Bible unfolds, it's going to help you have a geographical perspective. Now, some other uh, dimensions, or uh, not dimensions, but distances that I went and looked up for myself that Max doesn't uh, mention. If you go from Egypt all the way over to Iraq, uh, the estimates from Google Maps says it's 1,070 miles. Now keep in mind again that these people walked everywhere. They walked everywhere. Can you imagine walking a thousand miles? Would you even want to walk a thousand miles unless you were doing some kind of special event thing where you were trying to raise money, right? Another one, um, Egypt to Iran, 1,400, 1,400 miles to Jerusalem, 432 miles. That's nuts, right? That is nuts. I mean, it's just, it just is mind boggling to me, the distance and, and the fact that so many times when I read about these places, I never even gave any thought to the distance between these countries and that you just don't go flying over there in Old Testament times. They can today, but they couldn't back then. And then the other thing is when you talk about Israel, if you look on a world map, Israel is like a, a dot compared to everybody else surrounding her. And yet Israel is the one that everybody, that certain countries want wiped off the map. Just, just flick that little dot off of here and we'll be much happier, right? All right, let's see. I think that covered everything as far as Old Testament map goes. So I'm going to move out of the way so you can get a better look at it before I go ahead and pray us out. All right, well, let me go ahead and pray us out. And I would encourage you to do your research to look at a world map and get a better idea. Listen, the Bible, we're talking about prophecy. And I think I mentioned this in the last video. I haven't found, and there's many pastors who would say the same thing, have not found where America is mentioned in here. So as we're watching end time stuff, prophetical things happen. We need to be looking at this area. We need to be watching what's going on with this area and line it up with what the Bible says because there's prophecies in here that have not come true yet. 
They haven't happened yet. But we have a lot of movement. And with more countries than what I've shown up here, some pretty big countries, a lot of movement going on in this area that is referenced, okay, in the Bible. These areas are referenced in the Bible and there's things happening and we need to be paying attention. That's why I think right now, more than ever, reading our Bible and being in it and seeing what the Word of God has to say is going to be critical. It's going to be critical for you to know that, to be paying attention, to know what's coming, and to just not sit back clueless. And it's one of the reasons why I decided to re-record these videos. The last ones that I did several years ago had some sound issues. I'm hoping that we have improved that. And I'm hoping that bringing this subject up again will encourage people uh, to get back into the Word of God and see what He has to say. Because uh, the Bible, like in my prayer, is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, able to divide bone and marrow. And the Lord is faithful. He's true. His Word is true. And it would be very beneficial for you and for your friends and your family to know what the Word of God says so that you are not caught off guard. To be prepared. Because one day, Jesus is coming back. And I think that day sooner than later, based on everything, and I'm talking big picture. I'm not talking about what's happening here in America, although that's bad enough, that's big enough. But what's happening overseas, outside of our country we need to be paying attention to. Well, let me go ahead and close this out in prayer and then we'll dismiss. Father, I just thank you for the lesson on the Old Testament lands. I just thank you for the perspective that it gave me when I first studied it to realize how shallow I had been thinking about the land. That I didn't realize how far and how much the people went through to just get from place to place how far they traveled to just go and make their sacrifice. And Lord, I just thank you for opening my eyes to that. And Lord, I just pray that uh, if there's someone who is watching this today that doesn't know Jesus as their Lord and Savior, that Father, that would change today because all of this talk about how the Bible is set up and, and just trying to understand, Father, at the end of the day, it's just all going to point to your son Jesus and how he died on the cross for our sins and how he walked these lands himself when he came to earth as a baby and where he was born and the where he did his earthly ministry. Those are things that we'll be looking at in the future, Lord, and it's exciting to be able to see that and to know that those places still exist today. Father, I just thank you. And it's in Jesus' name that I pray. Amen. Well, thank you for joining me. Next time we are together, we're going to be looking at chapter number three. And that is on the historical books. And we're going to, last time we were together, we talked about how many historical books there were. There were 17. When we look at the historical books, we're going to be looking into the stories of the Old Testament and we're going to do like a what you would call a flyover view of those and uh, it'll be very helpful to you I believe I, and, and I just think this well this book for me was just I can't even tell you I mean it just was so beneficial to my understanding of the Bible which I think I've mentioned before but not only to me, but to other people that have read it as well. But to do that flyover view of the Old Testament stories, I think is going to be very beneficial. Uh, just like understanding where the land is, is beneficial and the types of books there are. Uh, I get excited about this stuff. I don't know if you could tell, but I get excited about it. I'm like, yeah, ah, because the Bible's hard enough to understand. But then if you don't understand the basic overview of it, it's even more difficult. And so then it doesn't need to be that difficult. It really can be easier. So that's what we're going to look at next time we're together. So thank you for joining me. 
and uh, you have a great day. Bye-bye. Thank you.